Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I wanted to show you guys an example of saving and loading that I set up for my Grid Builder plugin. So the Grid Builder allows you to place objects into the scene, and you probably want those objects to remain there when you change scenes or save and load the game, of course. So in order to make sure that that works, I set up some basic saving and loading scripts inside of the plugin demo. So we have the objects we can build over here on the right, and I want to place some into the scene. So for instance, if I take the pillar, and I do a drag build and we place 12 or so into the scene. Let's hit escape to exit build mode. I'm gonna hit save and then we'll move around. I'll hit load and we resume the position. And then also you can see that we have the same objects placed into the scene and the same amount of gold resources up here in the top left. Now, if I uh, place something like a smithy, which you can see costs 200 and then I hit load, then you'll see that that disappears from the scene and our character goes back to the position where we saved the game previously. So if I restart it and do the platform a demo, you can see I'm basically using the same code for each of them. So it doesn't particularly matter if you're doing a top-down or a platformer game or anything like that. Saving and loading is basically going to be the same. So let's uh, place some boxes in there. I'll hit save and now let's load. I'll place some more boxes and this time I'll load without saving. And you can see that those other boxes disappear. Also, if I move the position, you got the same thing going on as uh, the original. So if we want to take a look at what the save load system might look like, and keep in mind that this is just kind of a prototype. I haven't really done any extensive testing on it, but maybe this can point you in the direction of how you would set up saving in your own game. All of these scripts as well would be in the updated demo for the plugin. So if you have the plugin or your Ko-Fi or patron supporter, you should be able to download it and use basically however you wish. Uh, but let's kind of get started with it. So first off, I have this demo save load system. And inside of that system, we have a save game resource file. So if you know anything about resources, you know that they can be saved and loaded from your project. But you can also save and load resources to any file on your computer effectively. So when you want to save files instead of to the resources of the project down here in the file system, uh, but rather to where app data is stored on your respective operating system. So that would be uh, basically percent app data percent on Windows. And by that, I would mean going up here in File Explorer and being like app data percent. And then you'd be able to go find Godot. And inside of Godot, you'd have app user data. And here uh, would be the file data for all of your projects. So in grid building dev project, we can see I have my saves here, grid builder top down and platformer save. So aside from that, you're putting together the file name that will get saved here. And if we go down here to the save game function, how this operates is first, we gather all of the data that we need for the save. So I have individual resources for the player and the game levels that I'd be trying to save. Now here, you can see in this demo, I only have one level to save, so I'm not bothering saving uh, like five or six levels that I might load into the game world, but just one in an array. Uh, but each level has its own save data, and then a player can also have a resource for that as well. So these are also resource files, player save and level save. If I uh, search my project for save, we can look at those other files real quick. So in player save, you can see in export var, I have the global position. We also have the materials owned, which is basically just the inventory of the player. So where you saw the gold and the top down demo that was being stored in the item container of the player. So that's actually called the materials container. So the item container of materials stores the gold inside of its slots. So the slots would be a array of base item stack. And that's just another custom resource. So basically gold is a resource and I'd keep account of it in a stack and I save the data for that stack. So you can see for the init function for the resource, if a player is passed in, I save the state from that player. And then for that, whenever I save the state, I get the global position of the player and I get the materials container uh, data, the slots inside of that container, which is really just an array of item stacks. So with that data, that's going to be set in these export variables. If you're going to be saving resources with resource saver like this, uh, the variables have to be exported in order for the data to be saved to a file. So that is important here. If we look at level save, I'd have the same thing here. So you can see here I'd have a UID and a file path. Now currently I'm not using that, but if I was to be instantiating game levels that aren't attached to this main gameplay top-down scene, 
Uh, then I need to remember which UID and file path I pulled the game level from so that I would know uh, which game level I'm associating the saved level state with. So just something that I would go a step beyond this. When you instantiate the scene, you could uh, save the UID and the file path on the level script. And then you can use that when you're saving the level so that you can load it properly. Now, in this case, I don't need it because the level is always loaded up right there in the hierarchy. So I just need to replace the level with whatever I load in. Now, you'll see that I'm saving it as a packed scene. So with the packed scene, it's going to take the node. So in this case, that would be the game level. And then any other nodes uh, under it and the hierarchy that are considered to be owned by the game node. Now, that's not the same as being a child. If you want something to be owned by another node, then at some point uh, during creation of those child nodes, or just when you want to save the data, you would want to find all of those children nodes that you want to uh, associate with the game level, making the game level the owner, and then set the owner of that child node to the parent object. Then when you create the packed scene with uh, packed scene dot pack, like right here, it'll take the game level and any of its owned nodes, and it's going to put that inside of the packed scene resource. And since it's a resource, it can be saved to a file. So when we take the packed scene, you have the advantage that any of the objects in here, which were changed during gameplay, are going to be having their state saved. So when you load it, it'll be as it was when you saved it, which is helpful because sometimes objects would move around the screen or their statistics would change. So you wanna maintain that state. Now, the thing that might concern me here though is file size. So if I go and take a look, uh, this is the platformer save, one of them. Then we can see that when we save the parent scene, the game level and its owned child nodes like the tile map, that basically we're taking this whole tile map and we're saving just about everything about it. So you can see this adds a whole bunch of lines more of text. And that also means that the file size goes up a lot. So maybe the reason why the grid builder top down is not as much is just because there's not as many tiles in it or something. Uh, but in any case, just by having this one scene saved, it already goes up to a 152 kilobyte file. So you probably want to be careful about which nodes you're going to actually pack inside of that parent object. You wouldn't need to actually save the tile map unless your tile map is going to change during gameplay. But that's also possible, right? So for instance, maybe you would be allowing your player to place tiles in the middle of the game. And then you would want to know if any of the tiles have changed. So in that case, packing the tile map might make sense if you've got like a survival crafting game where the world can change like that. Otherwise, you could just choose to leave the tile map outside of that and uh, save on a bunch of save data space. But that's something uh, you probably just want to play around with and figure out what you should save and what you won't. So if I look at the player save again, then you'll see here I'm not actually doing the entire scene. I'm only saving and loading specific values from the player because currently I don't need the rest of it. I don't need to save. Uh, I mean, if we jump into, let's say, player builder here, I don't really need to save like the animation player or the collision shapes, right? Because those are going to be consistent. It's not going to change. So instead, I just save what's relevant, which is the position of the player. Uh, maybe the direction or the full transform with rotation scale and uh, position and the items in the inventory because obviously that can change and maybe you'd also throw stuff in there like statistics if you're doing an RPG like what's the strength of the player or what have you uh, but in general uh, that's kind of where I've gotten with that about setting up the uh, sub resources. Now, if we go take a look at the save game, then you'll see that this is actually really simple. The save game is just a resource that is composed of other resources. So here we got an array of level save resources in the case that you would be saving four or five level states in your game. Then uh, you would want an array for that, I think. And then the player save data, there's only one player. So we just need to have one resource here. So when we in the actual save load system, we call save game, then you can see we pack all the data into that resource. Uh, it might have a validate check to make sure that it's set up correctly so that I can get some warning messages. But then you call resource saver dot save. So here's the resource and then here's where you're putting it. So the save path, uh, I'm defaulting to this get, get full save path method. So if I don't set a specific path, then I'm just going to get the root path, which is user colon two forward slashes. And then the actual name of the file, p save name, and the file extension, which is .tres. I imagine .res would also work for resources, um, 
but that's uh, that's what I've got there. So if all goes well, resource saver saves it to a file. And that's where you end up with these resources here. So these are the saved game resources. And then to load that would basically do the reverse. I would get the file path where we're loading it from. And then I can check if the save exists before I try to load it. And if it is there, then I call resource loader dot load at the save path. And I can specify what kind of resource type I'm loading. So in this case, I know it's called save game. So I specify that. Um, there's some cache mode settings. I haven't really played a much around with that, but uh, if I had this file loaded up into the game, I would want to replace it with the new version, I think. But like, once again, I haven't really tested that. And when I load the resource, I'm doing that as a save game. So once I get the save game, I set it to that variable up here, the save game. So this is the last saved game loaded up into the game. So when I'm distributing the saved data to the objects in the game, I'm basically just going in reverse. So the level save resource, I'm calling load state on that, and I need to tell it where I'm loading the state into, which is the current level of the game. And then the same thing for the player save resource. Okay, so that's actually the save game, and then the player save resource here, calling load state on it, which is a method I just made. And we're loading the state into the current player of the world. So once again, those functions, it's just looking like save state, but in reverse. So we just pass the player in, then we tell the player's global position to be the saved position, and we tell the materials container items to be equal to the saved items. And then that loads what we need into the data. The load state for the level is a little bit different. So if you're loading a packed scene into your game, you need to instantiate it, which is going to take uh, the node that's at its root and all of its children and port it into your game. So that means you need to uh, basically add it to your hierarchy again. So I'm doing that with node.replace by. So I'm replacing the current level with the loaded level. Now, when you do that, it just replaces its position in the hierarchy, but it doesn't actually get rid of the level and all of its children. So that's why I'm calling uh, p level dot propagate call q free. So that means I'm calling q free on the current level the one to be replaced and all of its children, basically just meaning I'm freeing up that entire hierarchy. Come to think of it, you probably don't actually need to call propagate call because Q3, I think, clears up the children as well. But this technically works too. So Q3 is going to happen a little bit after. I think it's like at the end of the frame. So we tell the old level to be freed up. We have the new level instantiated. And the new level takes the position of the old level in the hierarchy. And then we want to make sure that on the world, the current level is the one we just loaded up. So we're replacing the base state of the scene with the level we just loaded up. So it's a complete replacement and put into the game. So now the current level becomes not the base editor version of that level, but the packed scene version that was saved to a file. So really quickly, how would that relate to the building system? So the building system places all of its objects on a placed objects parent. So you can see in the game level, I have placed objects target set here. And if you do change your game level, there's a function on the building system and grids targeting system called setup for level. So you would want to call that whenever you change your level and pass it in the data that it needs to update, like the new tile map or the new objects target. But basically all those objects are going to be placed under this placed objects target. Now, when I'm saving the game level, I set all of the children owners recursively, meaning including uh, two layers down, like whatever's under the placed objects tile, to have its owner set to the game level. So when we pack the game level, that's going to pack the tile map, the placed objects target, and any objects we create during game runtime into the packed scene. That gets saved to the file, and when we get it loaded back up, it's going to pull that data right back out, and we have the objects created and added back to our game. So uh, we could take a look at the hierarchy during gameplay real quick if you want. So I'll just place a few smithies there. Now let's take a look at the remote view. So this is the current in-game world. So if I expand game level, place objects target, we can see smithy one, two, three, and four here. So those objects will get saved when I press save and load. Okay, you can kind of see the remote view resetting there. And once again, they're all here, just as you would expect. So one change I made in this latest update is when the build happens for the objects being placed into the scene under this placed objects target. Because of how packed scenes work, I'm taking the instance owner, the object being placed into the game, 
and I'm setting the owner to be the placed objects parent. So this is the default. So by default, if you haven't changed anything else or changed the owners in your own save scripts, then the owner of the instanced objects is going to be this object's target, which makes logical sense since this is actually in the game world and the building system is not because it's just a node. It's a background system. So I think that change makes a lot of sense. But uh, that just means if you're going to be saving the entire level that you might want to recursively change everything you want to change and set the owner to be the game level. So this owner thing, as far as I know, it's important when you're instantiating objects or trying to save objects to a packed scenes. And that's generally what it's for. So that basically in a nutshell is uh, one example of doing saving and loading for object persistence um, inside of Godot. So these objects created during runtime can be saved and then loaded again. And all the new objects in the scene that are not in the editor still stay there and get loaded back into the scene exactly as they were before. So I figured it would be important to show at least one example of how this could be done. Up there we can see the UI didn't exactly update, but the actual amount in the inventory is correct. So I would probably want to make sure that that updates whenever uh, I load the game as well. But yeah, generally just working just fine. So if you want to take a look at the scripts, the Grid Builder plugin or the dev demo project for Grid Builder, I will have all of those up on links in the description. So thanks for watching to the end. I've been Chris and I will see you guys in my future video content.